Tony Dunn. Ain't nothing to it but to do it, brother. Let's roll. In a world where Carolina Panthers fans have an insatiable thirst for Panthers news and opinions, only one podcast roars ferociously. It's the C3 Panthers Podcast. Welcome back, Panther fans. You're listening to another episode of the C3 Beat Check, hosted by the C3 Panthers podcast, where on Wednesday nights, we put our ear to the beat and check out what's going on both around uh, the marketplace of ideas for the Carolina Panthers and the opponent. This week, we'll be um, hosting the Pittsburgh Steelers, and tonight we've got Mark Burgeon from Believe in Steelers podcast to come and help us preview this matchup tonight. We're going to look around at a couple of stories on the Panther websites of news and information that we all love and go to um, for that discussion um, and kind of just talk about uh, whatever's happened since yesterday because we're here for you every day of the week, it feels like. Um, And we had a fantastic show last night, Cody, on the Longest Running Panthers podcast. It's here Tuesday nights at 9. And last night, boy, we were excited and rocking and rolling. Yeah, we are. And I feel like we've uh, Panther fans and podcasters and just everyone alike, especially this team, we've cut a second win. We're playing uh, December football, you know, and it means something. We're actually playing for some stakes for all the marbles. I'm loving it, man. I feel like, uh, you know, I haven't felt like this in a long time as a Panther fan. So I'm pumped. We're one and six against the Pittsburgh Steelers. So we really have a chance to kind of do some uh, rewriting of history, kind of change our trajectory. And, you know, I'm happy to pick uh, a Steelers fan's brain tonight and, you know, check in on this matchup and see what it might hold. And you already know. We're going to do it with the best damn Panther fans and all of YouTube. We already got some in the chat right now. Adam Sanders, These Ill Skills, Dr. Rosen, JD864, Michael Davis, Tim Estes, and Panther Pickle. The crew is all here, Tony. Ain't nothing to it but to do it. Let's check the beat on the C3B check. Uh, guys, um, we're going to head over. We'll start with this is, uh, well, actually Mark Burgeon is going to join us in about 12 minutes around eight 30 to help preview this game. So until then, what we'll do is we'll kind of just peek around at, uh, the, the Panther, uh, websites of choice. So uh, let's start with cat crave, a uh, good friend of ours. Dean Jones uh, is running that. And, uh, today is, uh, the stories on the top of their list are Panthers avoid temp- QB temptation and CBS mock. So a lot a uh, already mock draft season, and like you said, we are playing for something in December, which is crazy. Uh, and then I guess the one that stands out to me, let's see, this is how Luvu's superb season compares to the NFL's best, right? And uh, yeah. Frankie Luvu has been. Oh, look at that! Hey, that's look at us. That. That's us right there on the C. That's the C Three Panthers podcast right there. You can find us on cat crave and look at that that's the big show from last night uh carolina panthers must protect the bank i guess that's what they'll look we're the beat at this point yeah man um, we really are let's see how this story starts out frankie louvu's emergence as the beating heart on the defense is reflected in recent statistics accumulated by carolina panthers outside linebacker let's see what those statistics are he's had three fumble recoveries and a block punt is that true yeah. Um, no, that I mean, was look, last year. Function. Let's see. What is he doing? Well, I think it means over his whole career as a Panther, just everything that he's been able to accomplish. I mean, look, it's not out of the realm of reality to say that he is easily one of our best players, defense or offense. I mean, the guy is a perfect outside linebacker. To be honest, you know, and I know this is a lofty resemblance to Bear, but to me, he kind of in his play style. He reminds me a little bit of Thomas Davis. He's not the fastest guy in the world. He's not necessarily uh, the biggest guy in the world. But, dude, he will run around and he will smack you in the mouth. He's incredibly intelligent. He knows where he needs to be at the right time. And he's a leader. 
I mean, to me, this guy could be a staple of our defense for years to come. I'm loving Lou. Uh, the the story reports this undoubtedly enjoying the best season thus far of his young career. How does Lou Vu stand up and, against some of the highest regarded and promising linebackers of today? According to Pro Football Reference, uh, Lou Vu compares favorably to Roquan Smith of the Baltimore Ravens, who is widely regarded as the best second level defender in the business. He writes, "This story is written by I give credit to it to Ricky Rains. So thank you, Ricky Rains, for looking into this." Uh, in 11 games this season, Frankie Louvu has amassed 78 tackles. Ooh, that's a big number right there because uh, he's going to crest 100. 12 tackles for loss, five sacks, one forced fumble, one interception, uh, which was returned for a touchdown. Roquan, Roquan in 12, 13 games, boy, has had 120 tackles. That's a lot of damn tackles. But he was yeah, yeah, yeah. doing everything in Chicago. Eight First tackles for loss. Uh, and four and a half sacks, three picks. Man, Roquan Smith is a freaking beast, bro. Yeah, that's why a lot of people wanted the Panthers to trade for him. Um, so let's hop over. We'll hop over to Cat Scratch Reader next. Uh, another great Panthers website. Let me see. I should be have these better queued up for you. See what they got going on. Nuance look at the playoff picture. Hey, man, the Bucks are falling apart, aren't they, Cody? They really are. <laughs> They're falling apart. Tom Brady is also not playing well, which I, I said earlier this year. That whole team, they're, they're not at full strength, and uh, they don't scare me, man. I know everybody thought Tampa was supposed to be the big bad Bucks in the division this year, but now nah, they're a shell of themselves. Uh, one of the things I thought, man, the line, I thought we were favorites against the Steelers. It says we opened up as dogs in uh, one of the stories. One story on their website right now uh, hitting his five key stats from the win over the Seahawks, Cody. I mean, over the Seahawks. I wonder what do you think they were before we get into them. I haven't looked at this story. So it's going to be turnovers, right? Like the turnover battle because we get right. like two picks and one, and they lead to scores. It's going to be the rushing uh, yards, right? Like as in 260, whatever, or 16 yards from scrimmage or whatever that is. Um, what are you going to do? Look, they're waving at J.C. Horn. I bet you the pick, J.C. Horn stats, they're probably yeah. going to highlight him shutting down DK for the most part. What else do you think the other stat is? Something with Eddie Pinero since he was the player of the week for something for special teams? Uh, I mean, yeah, but I mean, if is it just offense or defense, or is it, just, or is it both? I don't know. This uh, is what this, I mean, the, this I would, says dude, five key stats from the win. So it could be, I'm thinking that it's going to be anything, probably yards per carry, like just the okay. amount of yards our offensive line is and our running backs are, are, are being able to put out there on film. I mean, they're moving people around. Do we have three guys running the football at a high clip? That's on there. And by the way, Tony, I was watching that clip again of that J.C. Horn interception where he drops back into coverage. Dude, J.C. Horn's hips are as smooth as silk. I mean, the way that, that you know, during the combine, when you hear about defensive backs that can flip their hip and get vertical in the other direction, like J.C. Horn is the epitome of that, dude. He's so talented. So good. So happy that it's on our team. There is a cool tweet floating around by Justin Blackman, which I need to know. Is this the guy that fizzled out and had all the problems in Jacksonville? Because if it is, he is really making a resurgence as an analyst, which nobody, it can't be the same Blackman. Um, Because I remember that dude being really dumb in Jacksonville. I hope I'm not insulting the guy because if he is, he's not as dumb. He's like, this. his name's Justin Blackman. He's got this. Uh, he was a, I don't know. He's an analyst for somebody right now. And uh, what he was saying is this, is that this dude covered a seven route and a China route or something. <laughs> because if you saw that, like he was, he came off of his route to get that interception. So he was defending two yeah. players at once. Right. Is yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. So, all right, all right. So here are the five stats right now that they're, uh, two QB hits, one sack, two tackles for loss. So they highlight Frankie Louvu's game. Uh, all right, so Frankie Louvu is their first stat. 
Uh, one interception, two passes defended uh, by the Panthers. Let's see. We only had one interception. I thought we had two. I swear we had two. 99 yeah, scrimmage two. yards. Uh, let's see. Chuba Hubbard had 14 carries for 74 yards and a touchdown while 20. So they're highlighting Chuba's stats. Yeah, I told you it'd be something related to the Russians. Uh, Terrace Marshall Jr. Uh, with a crazy catch. Wow. These are not the stats I would have thought that uh, four and four record uh, for Wilk so far. So interesting stuff there. And uh, here, this is on. I'm going to pop over real quick to. Um, hold on. Let me see if I can do this real. I got to stop doing just the tab. Um, on the Panthers website right now. Uh-huh. Uh, key story right here that we talked a little bit about last night. We got some new news and that is a DJ more full participant in practice. So that's important for our yes. offense going into this, uh, this game. Yeah. And that's a sigh uh, of relief. go check out Bradley Bozeman, uh, mic'd up. Uh, <laughs> it's fun. It's a fun watch. And I saw both Nikki Bozeman and Bradley, uh, faved our short today. Cody of you, uh, last night on the show saying, um, Number one, numero uno priority, right? We made a great short on YouTube of that clip yeah. today. So you guys go back and check out. The Wait, Super tell Pit. me that first part again. Who liked it? Both Nikki and Bradley Bozeman did. Yeah, we are yeah. here, boy. Let's go. Yeah, I know, man. We uh, So we're trying to delve a little bit into cutting up some of the long form show into those shorts. But don't forget, you can check out the C3 Panthers podcast, 9 o'clock, uh, Tuesday nights live. Going in, we're in uh, our 10th st- season, Cody. I was messaging Miles Hartfield trying to land us an interview with a player. Yeah, same. Me um, too. And uh, I was thinking about it. If there's – we're we're approaching what? That would be 500 episodes, I think. 10 years, once a week at the minimum. And when yeah. we've been doing – we've already crested 500 because we do multiple shows a week now that we didn't do eight, nine years ago. But – Right. Uh, we've been rocking and rolling. So you guys make sure to smash the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe um, and check us out. Next, we got uh, Friday night, the Friday free for all Saturday, uh, the Saturday simulation, Madden simulation, which has been fun with CK. And don't forget the post game on Sunday nights. Uh, Cody, let's go ahead and bring in our guest, Mark Burgeon of the Believe in Steelers podcast. I am terrible at pronouncing people's names. Strangely, I hope I got it. <laughs> It is Bergen, but that's okay, Bergen. fellas. See, I totally knew it. It's okay. I'm, it's the, okay. I'm from Winterville, you're, North Carolina, dude. Hey, you're wearing a Batman shirt all as well, and it's not every day. You get to go on the longest-running Panthers podcast. In fact, you guys have been on for 10 years in all seriousness. Like, Ike and I, we're in our fourth season now, but, like, I got to give kudos to both of you guys. That's dedication in all seriousness. But thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm excited to talk Steelers and Panthers tonight. Yeah, the, thank you, man. Thank you. And thanks for coming on the show. We've This show's been through many evolutions and iterations over nine years from me trying to figure out how to stream on the internet in 2013. <laughs> um, and that's where it all started is like, yeah. uh, which is wild because it seemed so bizarre at the time. Like no one was really doing it. It almost seemed ridiculous, like to say you were an adult with kids and trying to make <laughs> Uh, football videos and you're like and people are like oh man you have a real job dude why are you doing this and then now people it's like a uh, part of people's daily job uh, you're weird if you don't have a podcast yeah <laughs> <laughs> no doubt fellas right. can i ask you a quick question at the top do you know why it's called a podcast no i have no uh no. wait wait no let's see pod cabs no i have no so idea. the reason why is when apple was starting this way back when you had um, you had not before the iPhone, you had actually oh, iPod. iPods. Yeah. There's a broadcast for an iPod. And I remember the days you'd have to download the podcast to your computer, plug your iPod in, download it to your, to your device. And then you could listen to it that way before you could even access internet on your iPod. But that's the reason why it's called a podcast, which I didn't know about until wow. this year. But yeah, there you go. I'm sure Apple is t- suing somebody trying to get royalties <laughs> for every time we say podcast or whatever. Uh, and which is kind of also just in while we're on this crazy rant is that uh, 
it's almost like an archaic form of art, like uh, consuming media now. Like as now, like I feel like we go to YouTube and some different ways is like the old school podcast is, I don't know. It's like the old hats listen to podcasts in some ways, like uh, the adults. Now I guess you got to have a TikTok platform or something like that. But let's jump <laughs> into the, uh, the, the Panthers are, um, you know, surprisingly playing for something in December, man. If you would have asked us this a month and a half ago, would have been hard to forecast uh, us like being kind of in contention for maybe a playoff spot at this point. Actually, for a real, for winning the division is real potential as the Buccaneers are falling apart. So as the Pittsburgh Steelers come to Bank of America and our coach pleads for us to protect the bank or demands from his players to protect the bank, we are excited about this game, but we're also a little fearful when it comes to how many damn Steeler fans travel to the dang games. Good. God, Mike Tomlin is facing potentially his first losing season ever. What are you mm -hmm. expecting about this game? What's on your mind? What are you guys talking about when it comes to the Steelers in this matchup? Well, the big question right off the top is the health status of Kenny Pickett leaving last week's game against the Ravens with a concussion. So can he go? If he can go, he's got to be the starter. And had he not gotten again – Hurt against the Ravens. It is of my opinion that the Steelers would have won that game. So if Pickett can't go, the question then turns to who do you start? Do you go with Mitch Trubisky, who has not looked great in his four starts and throw three interceptions in relief of Pickett? Do you go with Mason Rudolph, who you only have under contract for the remainder of this season? Do you give him a whirl? I'm of the proponent, if Pickett can't go, see what Rudolph can do because we all know what Mitch Trubisky is at this point in his career with 54 career starts, 30 and 24 as a starter. At this point in his career, he's a backup. And so I see, can Mason Rudolph, do you want to retain him beyond this season? And then if he does play well, maybe you drive up his price to whichever team signs him in the offseason. They got to fork over a little bit more coin. I would be inclined to start Rudolph also because, God forbid, there's an injury. I'm looking to 2023 and beyond. You keep Trubisky healthy. He's under contract in 2023. If there is an injury, I'd rather that injury go to Rudolph than Trubisky. So that's kind of my logic. I'm operating under the assumption that at five and eight, the Steelers are out of the playoffs, at least in the AFC. If you want to trade divisions, I'm open to having that conversation with both of you fellas, because at five and eight, the Panthers are still very much alive in the playoff hunt in the NFC South. You know, something that you just mentioned too, is we're 0 and 3 uh, against your division. We've lost to the Ravens. We lost the season opener to the Browns and uh, the Bengals too, especially after the Bengals game. That was when Panther fans were at our lowest. Cause that was just such a, just a trubbing. But one of the things that the Panthers have done really well in recent weeks is run the football. Uh, you know, we have Deontay Foreman, Raheem Blackshear, and Truba Hubbard. They're really doing well. And me and Tony have been saying this is one of the best offensive lines that the Panthers have ever had. They are that good right now. How would you say the Steelers' run defense has been this year? And how, what do you expect them to look like against this uh, resurgent rush defense or rush offense of the of the Panthers? Yeah, it's been a totally different identity under Steve Wilkes. I don't need to tell both of you, but that's been the huge difference between Wilkes and Matt Rule. So when the Panthers, uh, I've got two stats for you, leading the NFL in rushes between the tackles with 199 and second in rushing yards between the tackles since week seven, it's been a night and day difference between Matt Rule being the head honcho and then also trading away Christian McCaffrey over to the 49ers. Yeah. So there's that, and so you have a completely different identity. And when after the last win, they asked Sam Darnold after the game, what's the difference between Wilkes and Matt Rule? And he says, running the ball. Listen, this is coming from your quarterback, and he's saying that. The Steelers' run defense has been better than it was a year ago. The Steelers had a strange dichotomy last season where they ranked number one in the NFL in sacks, but they were also dead last in rushing yards allowed. But you saw some of the struggles that they have up front on display last week against the Ravens. When the Ravens, uh, Huntley went down the backup and the Ravens put in their third string quarterback making his NFL debut. 
And the Steelers putting eight men in the box and they still couldn't stop it. Five yards per carry for the Ravens. It wasn't just J.K. Dobbins coming back for Baltimore. It was also Ronnie Stanley, the star tackle on the offensive line to where they controlled things up front. Teams have demonstrated they can do that against the Steelers defense. That's a little bit bend, but don't break because you look at the scoreboard and you say, okay, yeah, you're allowing five yards per carry, but you're only allowing 16 points per game and you're only giving up, say, field goals on the back end. So that to me is where it is an Achilles heel of the Steelers defense, but they have been better. They have improved compared to a season ago. Tony, I think you're muted if you're talking. Yep, I am. Uh, Cody, this is just a little joke for you before we move on. As we've Mm -hmm. been arguing over Brian Burns being paid like like a top defensive end in this league, if Mason yeah. Rudolph starts this game, Cody, do we have to pay Brian Burns more if he rips his head off and hits him with a helmet across <laughs> oh, yeah. his head and has oh, some dude. sort of fight? Because then I think he's entered the stratosphere of Miles Garrett type money. Yeah, Honestly. you don't even have yeah. to ask me that. that Mason that Rudolph makes... head coming off. No. Um, all right, well, Mark. Let's... I think you bring up a good point, though, too, if I could interject. Yeah, when please. you think of Mason Rudolph, that's the first thing that you think of him as a Steelers quarterback. Not yeah. exactly a great sign where no. you know, an on-field fight is the first thing that you think about In instead of N-word. something he's accomplished <laughs> on the field. Well, listen. We don't I, know I, if he said, I know. Yeah. We don't know, but trust my Garrett right now. I, I'm going to say this. If you want to relitigate that, Garrett's accusation came out a full week after that yeah. brawl happened. Yeah. So if you want to relitigate that yeah. and the league never found any evidence and there's players on the field on both sides saying, we didn't hear that. I'll leave that. We don't need to relitigate you're right. that. That's but the if, first you, if you want to, if you want to uncover the first rocks, thought, that's though. what happened. You're yeah. right. That's the yeah. first thought when you think about him. And I'm sure he's looking for an opportunity uh, to, to kind of put on some good tape. And certainly Mitch Trubisky has not put on any good tape. I can't imagine he was, Freaking terrible. If he just makes one play yep. last week, uh, you guys win that game somehow, or at least uh, c- could win that game. Uh, the Steelers gave up a lot of yards late in that game on the ground. Was this was last week, Mark, uh, the loss to the to the Ravens? Was it because of Mitch Trubisky's yep. turnovers, or was it because of a team kind of well, just lack, not lack, just all total team loss? Because that defense crumpled under the run late in the game. It was a few things. Trubisky's three interceptions, all three of them came in Ravens territory. The Steelers went two of four in the red zone. You leave points on the board and it's going to cost you against good teams. Class Campbell also blocked a field goal. So you're talking about the possibility of, if you're getting field goals, 12 more points on the board. And it was a two point difference. That was the difference between winning and losing. It wasn't the interceptions. Not all interceptions are created equal. It was where they came on the field in the situation where when you're throwing them in Ravens territory, you're preventing your team from putting up much needed points for an offense that struggled when points are a premium. Another thing I do not understand, you're coming off a week where George Pickens had one catch on two targets. He has three catches on three targets for 78 yards. Why did the Steelers not go back to Pickens again and prove that the Ravens could stop him? When I look across the division and I see Jamar Chase, and I'm not saying George Pickens is Jamar Chase, don't get confused here. But when I see Jamar Chase has 10 catches on 15 targets this past week, it's like, can the Steelers not steal that same recipe in getting who, in my opinion, is their most effective player and their most dynamic playmaker on the offensive side of the football? Well, you just talked about your playmaker, uh, Pickens, on the offensive side of the football. Before you came on, me and Tony were talking about our burgeoning star on the defensive side of the football. Somewhere I expect to be lined up right and right across mm-hmm. from Pickens, and that's J.C. Horn. And right now, PFF has him as his low, uh, as the lowest passer rating allowed at 35.8. You know, there's been a lot of litigating as to who the Panthers should have picked that draft. Should it have been Justin Fields? Should it have been J.C. Horn? But J.C. Horn is having a tremendous year for us this year, and he has pretty much locked up every receiver 
that he's had to go up against. You know, I know you talked about your quarterbacks and that being kind of an area of concern, but do you have the exterior weapons to be able to get open on the outside so whoever your quarterback is actually has someone to pass the ball to? Well, the Steelers have the weapons, but the sum don't doesn't equal its parts. A sure. season ago, Najee Harris and Deontay Johnson were both Pro Bowl alternate players because the Bengals were in the Super Bowl. So both of them played in the Pro Bowl a season ago. Their production hasn't been there this season. Now, Najee has been better since the bye week. I'll concede that. But Deontay Johnson still does not have a touchdown in the 2022 season. One of many failures by the Steelers offense this season. Pat Fryermuth's a very good second-year player at the tight end position. He's battled with concussions a little bit. He's a nice player. You have enough confidence in George Pickens to say, hey, we can trade Chase Claypool to Chicago, get a second-round pick, and get that rookie contract for four seasons because one position the Steelers do not have issues drafting and developing is, is at wide receiver. So they have the parts, but it's like, can you scheme it up and can you get them the football? And that's where a lot of fans, myself included, are calling for Matt Canada's job as the offensive coordinator because when you when points are a premium and you're averaging less than 20, 21 points per game, whatever the league average is right now heading into week 15, it's just not good enough. And this past week when you give up only 16 points to the Ravens, this isn't you know the old school football where you know 10 to 7 games you would see from a decade plus ago. The league has changed. It favors offensive football. It favors scoring, and the Steelers have not been able to do that. So – I'll say this. I mean, the Panthers look good because I look forward to the day with J.C. Horn where he pays homage to his daddy. And when he gets a pick six, takes the phone into the end zone. Gets the phone out. And I'll say this yeah. too. Iki Aquanu at the left tackle position out of NC State. Yeah. He's a kid in our backyard. I live in Raleigh. And so they were calling him the, the king of the pancake block. And they were giving him bottles of maple syrup for all the pancakes he was having at the <laughs> collegiate level. If I'm a running back or quarterback, young in this league, and I know I've got a bodyguard for the next decade plus and someone who can pave the way and who is nasty up front, and or if I'm a quarterback, I know my blind side is protected. This is someone I get really, really excited about. And I'm telling you this, you guys are the longest running Panthers podcast. It is your responsibility to get Iki Aquanu a sponsorship, whether it's with IHOP. Denny's, if you want to go Cracker Barrel, in all honesty, yeah, he's yeah. that good up front, and he's only going to get better and better and better with more experience. Got to be IHOP. Yeah, it has Inter- to be. International yeah. House of Pancakes. Yeah. Iquanu House of Pancakes. Dude, he's incredible. <laughs> I love it. House I love it. Pancakes. I love it. Yeah, and you know, uh, the coolest thing, Mark, he grew up a Panthers fan. There's videos and pictures of him in the stadium with his mom and dad wearing Panthers jerseys. So it's a, it's been a nice story for us. You know, we, uh, we love us some at Kevin Kwanu. Um, going back to this matchup, Mark, for a long time, one of my favorite coaches in the NFL has been Mike Tomlin for the consistency that he has shown year after year. And he's never had a losing season. And to me, a lot of that speaks for itself. However, I have been hearing that there are many of Steelers fans who are so unhappy with Tomlin that they want to see him lose his job after this year. Where do you stand <laughs> on this matter? And what what is the real truth behind this season and Mike Tomlin? Sure. So about a year ago on our show, on the Believe in Steelers show, we talked to a writer by the name of John McClain. He's covered the oh, NFL yeah. for almost five yeah. decades. Texans guy. I covered yep. the Texans for Houston. Yes, Chronicle. sir. Yep. And he's also a fantastic interview. Oh, I mean, <laughs> when you've been around that long, you have stories for days. Yeah. But he told us, he said, if the Steelers and Mike Tomlin ever decided to part ways, Mike Tomlin would have a job with one of the other 31 teams by sundown on the same day. Tells me all I need to know about Mike Tomlin and his track record of success. Consider this. The Steelers haven't had a losing season since 2003. Consider that their highest draft pick was Devin Bush in 2019 with the 10th overall pick, a pick they traded up for. So they haven't bottomed out to where, you know, if you floor a truck, eventually it's going to run out of gas. If you go to your cupboard and you go to your refrigerator and you continually take food from it and take food and you don't ever replenish it, it's going to go bare at some point. And that's what's happened with the Steelers. There was a game, I want to say two years back, Mike Tomlin's on the field before the game talking with 
Chase Young, the star defensive end, uh, out of Ohio State, young player in the league, stud off the edge. And he's just laughing at him. Mike Tomlin, and I'm paraphrasing here, he goes, we never draft high enough to get guys that look like you. Well, that's reflective of what's going on with the Steelers to where there's a lot of holes. You have a rookie quarterback. You have a new defensive coordinator. You have a new general manager. Your Hall of Fame quarterback just retired. So this we knew this season was going to be tough because there is some talent on both sides of the ball. Deontay Johnson's like the elder statesman. He's 26 years old. Yeah. So you knew this was going to be a bit of a transition this year. And I give him the benefit of the doubt. I know he hasn't had the playoff success in recent seasons, but think about how many other franchises would love to be in the Steelers shoes and their track record of record of success to where, you know, at this point you want to get a better draft pick, but at the same time, you want to make sure you foster a winning culture. And that's really what the Steelers are grappling with this season in oh what will likely be my 2023 wasn't a good year for the Carolina Panthers, but I'm trying to make 2024 a better one for myself. Get started on your resolutions with Factor so you're ready for the new year. Factor's ready to eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including keto options, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Skip that overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door, and they're ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Head to factormeals.com slash C350 and use the promo code C350 to get 50% off. That's code C350 at factormeals.com slash C350 to get 50% off. It's Tomlin's first losing season. Cody, this conversation of the draft pick and the culture, Jesus. Jesus. How, well, first of all, the Steelers can never have to have that conversation. They can they can be the worst team in I the hope. league and still have the culture. I mean, Jesus, like they've only been ridiculously successful. And shame on any Steelers fan who that's what they get. They're spoiled ass brats. No offense. I'm not trying to be mean, but like, it's kind of like when you hear new England Patriot fans mm -hmm. talking, it's just like, gosh, man, we all, we were following cam uh, when he went there and it was just like, gosh, you are some spoiled mugs, man. We would love to have that. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to, so that's bizarre when it comes to Tomlin that people would even think that Yeah. But here to follow up on that. Um, one of the things we're, we're going to be looking for a new head coach. We fired our head coach this past, uh, this past year. Now, while Steve Wilkes is making a real claim to that position and that job right now, we have been kind of forecasting the coaching position for two years now in this place is not only did we debate endlessly on this show when we, before we hired Matt rule after a year or two, we were re like, we saw it, we saw it, at least I was done with them after last season. I'm usually pretty patient on these things. But the central debate we have had is whether or not you should have uh, the benefits and the drawbacks of having a defensive coach versus an offensive coach. Mm -hmm. And really, the, the we've had only defensive coaches really in the history of our success as a as a team. And the kind of the difficulty for a defensive coach, or at least in our mind, has been why the draw of an offensive mind is that when they do have success, the coordinators ultimately leave. And when they have a good offensive coordinator and he leaves for another job, it's sometimes hard to keep that success rolling mm -hmm. because you need to have somebody good to step in that role. We've looked around the league and really tried to have identified defensive coaches, one of them being a former Panther coach and Sean McDermott that have been able to weather this storm and are trying to figure out if that's a risk that we're willing to take. Belichick, but you got to make Tomlin in there as like a key example. But you're talking about the offense right now. Can you maybe give us a little perspective on kind of how uh, Tomlin is navigating a offense that's struggling? Yeah, it's 
Look, I'll just be frank with both of you. I will be surprised if Matt Canada retains his job in 2023. Now, this was supposed to be the year when Ben Roethlisberger retired and you play 18 seasons in the league. Father time's going to catch up with you. He's headed for Canton, no doubt. But he couldn't move around like he could earlier in his career, in the last few few years of his career. And this was supposed to be the year, whether it was Trubisky back there or Pickett, that you could open up the playbook. You could be more exotic. You could move the quarterback around. You could do RPOs. You could bootleg the quarterback. You could run read option. And again, I mean, I would argue that the offense has been even worse. It's for a variety of reasons. Everyone's got to look at accountability. But at the same time, it's just like, I don't know what the argument would even be to say, Matt Canada, you're going to come back next year because Kenny Pickett has made strides, but it's just these game plans don't make sense. And the predictability of the offense is evident. If it's evident for me, who's someone who watches the games, I can't even imagine what it's like for an opposing team's defensive coordinator where they know what's coming before it happens. You have to have counters and ability to adapt and be able to maximize and utilize the talent that you do have on your roster. And this is something that the Steelers have struggled with, with the offensive coordinator. I mean, if I'm being honest, dating back to when Bruce Arians used to be the offensive coordinator, you know, you go from him to Todd Haley to Randy Feekner, then Matt Canada who was the quarterback's coach under Feekner when the Steelers finished dead last in the league in rushing a few years back. And it came down from Art Rooney, the owner, saying, hey, that's never going to happen again. And that's why the Steelers draft Najee Harris in the first round of Al- out of Alabama. Well, Najee's a nice player, and I think he's struggling uh, with injuries this season and behind an offensive line that, frankly, isn't that strong. And I know that you had, you know, David DeCastro came and went. It was towards the end of his career. Marquise Pouncey retired. The Steelers haven't had an offensive lineman drafted in the first or second round of the draft. Since 2012, when they when they drafted David DeCastro, who's a multi-time Pro Bowler at the God, guard position, does this sound like the, this uh, sounds like over, us. This debate over a lot of similarities, culture, a lot of similarities. Uh, the debate over culture and draft pick, and an offensive line that and that you haven't invested in in a decade, and real, uh, coll- you know, collateral or capital, should I say? Um, I wanted I, to ask about this defense, though, mm-hmm. real quick, is that the Carolina Panthers, I believe, are one in six against the Pittsburgh Steelers historically. I don't know if it's seems like we would have played them more, but I know we play every preseason. So I'm sure that that I mean, that clearly that's not counting that stat. But, you know, uh, one of the last times I guess the last time we played the Steelers maybe was the big blowout on Thursday night where. Mm-hmm. Uh, T.J. Watt uh, destroyed Cam Newton's sh- shoulder and ended yeah. really his time in Carolina. And what was a really a hot run under Norv Turner. Uh, and the last time we were good, uh, and we started, I think, five and one or five and two or something like that. But the Panthers, every time we've played the Steelers, have struggled with the three four defense historically. Now we do have our best offensive line, arguably in almost team history. Some people believe at this point. But that 3-4 defense has given us fits for decades, it feels like. Mm-hmm. How is that defense? Is it the same defense that has you know, frustrated us in the past? No, the Steelers are running a lot more cover, too, this season. I personally think that's because, other than Minka Fitzpatrick, that they don't have the personnel to match up with opposing teams' receiving course. That's just my opinion. But remember, Mike Tomlin before he came over and was the Steelers coach, he used to be the defensive uh, the defensive backs coach for the Tampa Bay Bucks, And then he served for one season as the defensive coordinator for the Minnesota Vikings. So this truly is a Mike Tomlin defense, but you're seeing them run a lot more cover too than they have in seasons past. And it, it is different. While they still do run three, four, it's a different defense that you saw under say, you know, many years ago when Dick LeBeau was the defense coordinator, or Keith Butler, who uh, retired after the 2021 season. So there are some similarities. There are some wrinkles, but it, it is different than that traditional 3-4 Steelers defense that you've seen, you know, for the last 10, 15, 20 years or so. 
I wanted to go back to the quarterback position for a minute and and can you pick it and we know he's dealing with the concussions mm-hmm. right now. But long term, you know, I know it's his season and and that can get kind of murky no matter what kind of talent you are. You know, we've been arguing on this podcast about Trevor Lawrence. I'm a big Clemson fan. They love to bust my balls and tell me how underwhelming he's been. But, you know, it really does. It takes a whole team, and it takes a coaching staff that's going to uh, spend time developing your quarterback. Do you believe that you have a guy worth developing long-term and can they pick it? Or do you think that the Steelers are going to be going back to the quarterback well sometime in the near future? It's not how the Roonies operate traditionally. Now, since the lockout in 2011, when there's the rookie salary cap, this is why you saw the Cardinals did this with Kyler Murray. I know that back in the day, Washington did it with RG3 and Kirk Cousins. But when you're the quarterback, you're the CEO, you're the face of the franchise. And if the Steelers were to say, Hey, we really like one of these young studs coming out in the 2023 draft, whether it's, you know, CJ Stroud or Bryce young, whoever it ends up being, you're sending mixed messages. Now, remember Kenny Pickett played his college ball at Pitt, So he's accustomed to playing at what used to be Heinz field is now Acershire stadium, but I'll give you a quick history lesson here. Back in 1983, the Steelers passed on another Pitt quarterback by the name of Dan Marino. And they instead draft a defensive lineman who his name slips me, but Senor Sack was his nickname. And long story short, he didn't live up to that nickname in the NFL. And so I don't think the Rooney family ever forgot that when Pickett was available at number 20 in this past year's draft, there was no way they were going to pass up on him. Now, I like the moxie what I've seen. He said all the right things in the media sessions. And I've seen progressions that might not necessarily show up on a stat sheet. Let me walk you through what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. entering last week's game he had four consecutive games where he hadn't thrown an interception that was an issue early on when he came in to relieve Mitch Trubisky so he was learning how to protect the football and when to take shots and when to put his team in position to say hey now I can take a risk this is when I need to be more risk averse I go to the Falcons game where late game situation coming out of a two-minute warning finds Deontay Johnson that they trust him to get a first down Falcons take a timeout Then they have two. They bottle up Najee Harris, and it's a third and five play. They decide to run Pickett on a bootleg. He smartly decides to – he doesn't get the first down, but he decides to slide to keep the clock moving, number one. He avoids injury because he's running on the left side of the field with his right shoulder exposed. He avoids injury. He doesn't fumble, and the clock is moving to where the Falcons then have to drive down the full length of the field to try to get a, a, a field goal to tie up the game with 40 seconds left down at their own one yard line after the punt down distance situation and understanding and playing the chess match of when you look at the box score of that game, you say, Oh, less than 200 yards passing and a touchdown. Not that impressive. It's not what dictated the the game dictated. Right. And so it's that situational awareness to me where you're already seeing some of that progression, even as a rookie, He's 24 years old. He has four years of experience starting at Pitt. But there's more to the quarterbacking position than the flashy throws and the rocket arm and running around and making magic and wizardry happen. There's things that go into the quarterbacking position that aren't flashy. They won't make headlines, but it's the difference between winning and losing. And I'm starting to see that even as a rookie from Kenny Pickett, and that excites me. Yeah, you know, he was in consideration for us as well because Matt Rule had recruited him when he Mm -hmm. uh, was still the coach at Temple. You know, uh, there were rumors that David Tepper, our owner, really liked him. Mm -hmm. But uh, ultimately, we didn't end up going to make it. But we do have Sam Darnold. And, you know, Sam Darnold has been much maligned. He's Mm -hmm. gotten a lot of hate over last year. Uh, and, and the fact that we passed on other QB options for Sam Darnold. My question to you is kind of specific. Do you think that there has been enough film on Sam Darnold this year for the Steelers to be able to key in on mm-hmm. some of his tendencies to kind of slow down the things that have been making him successful this year? That's a great question. And to answer your question, probably not. I mean, I know they're 2-0 with Darnold as the starter this year. And then I would say, okay, well, 
what did he do last year as the Panther starter? Well, remember, Matt Rule's now no longer there. Right. So he's not going to be asked to do some of the same things he was asking to do under a different head coach. So to answer that question, probably not. But, I mean, you could also go back to tape that he had when he was the quarterback of the Jets as well. Um, so that's kind of what I would say with that. I mean, the <laughs> I don't need to tell both of you fellas the Panthers quarterbacking situation. On the surface, it's like, oh, okay, let's take a flyer on Baker Mayfield. But it's, you know, drafting Matt Corral and P.J. Walker and then uh, the trade that you made for Mayfield. And it's just like all the picks to where you're pretty high up in terms of salary cap allocation, the quarterbacking position. But really, the Panthers have been trying to find the guy since Cam Newton left him. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't need to yeah. tell you guys that, but um, oh, and I know we were a lot of us ran on picket. Um, you mentioned history and uh, I don't know. This is, this is one of these who knows if anybody really knows the answer to this. And maybe you've never even heard this part of it is that, but we've had connections between Carolina and the Rooney family in a way is that our former owner, Jerry Richardson always was very good friends with this. Them, he liked their kind of, measured style and how important they were to the league and jerry richardson modeled everything about the shield and this which the irony is that he kind of left in a little scandal at the end but (laughs) our new owner used to be a minority owner with the pittsburgh steelers Mm -hmm. rumor has it rumor has it that david tepper may have been part of a a group that was essentially interested in a coup d'etat to get mike tomlin out a long time ago is this – have you heard anything about this that maybe – Cody, well, how long ago was it? Maybe about six years yeah, ago? Yeah, it's years ago? It, yeah, it's, it's been a few years now. There, there was a, a, a list of uh, – It was like minority unnamed owners. minority owners interested yeah, but they were unhappy pretty, with Tomlin. They were all, all the articles were fairly certain to mention David Tepper's name amongst that list. I don't know how they verified that. But it definitely made the rounds that David Tepper was not a fan of Tomlin. Have you heard anything about that, Mark? That's the first I've heard that. Okay. Now, I know that Tepper obviously has the ties with the Steelers. He's a 5% owner at one point, what, back in like 2009, 2010 range, probably whatever was the Was he not that long? That. I mean, I guess maybe he had to sell. Or, I mean, I, I thought he didn't sell until he tried to buy the Panthers. Wasn't sure about that. That's okay. That's my that's my understanding. I want to make sure I ask you fellas some questions. Um, because I've got some questions as my sure. own. I really have three. If you want to go rapid fire, we could, but um do you want Steve Wilkes to be your head coach week one, twenty twenty three? I know I do. I really do. I yeah, I you know, I've said this over the course of our podcast in the past few weeks. Mm-hmm. I don't know of another man who could have turned around this just depressing season yeah. not even this season but the past few years panthers have been really down in a low place and the fact that steve wilkes has come in and gone four and four i mean that's that that's a it's a testament to who he is and he's been on this panthers team when this franchise had its most success you know we were going to the super bowl we had good defenses mm-hmm. And I, I, I believe most people believe that Steve Wilkes, when he was in Arizona, never really truly got a chance to be the head coach that he wanted to be with that organization. He's from Charlotte, went to West Charlotte, went to Appalachian State. Like, we just love the guy. I don't know if it's true. I'm hearing rumors that David Tepper still might want a young, offensive-minded guy. But if you take the temperature of the Panthers fan base, yeah, we're pretty much – uh, firmly behind Steve Wilkes at, at this point in time. We feel like he's earned it. And th- and that's how I feel. You know? Yeah, well, uh, on top of that is each week that this team improves, the harder the the answer to say that you want somebody else uh, realistically is for not only a fan, but at this point is you're starting to, if you are an owner like Tepper or just any business leader, is like, who's a name that could, that is more, not exciting, but I, I guess more qualified at this point. You know, it's like it would really take a big name uh, to to say, you know what, you've done a great job 
running our business for the last year. Imagine if you were like your manager of a company, you know, or whatever, you're the, the president of a company quit and you're, you're promoted as a VP or as an interim president. And you do a great job with the company. And man, everybody's like, man, this, I, we're really surprised about how well you did. And then you go, you know what, though? We're going to hire this guy over you. That name would have to be, I've been trying to think of who that name could be if it was and who that would. And I think Harbaugh is the only one that, would have enough credence at this point. Frank I just don't think you could get like that. Yeah, I, I don't know if Sean Payton would have any interest either. Yeah, I know I, we can't get been... that. We wouldn't be able to get that because the Saints would never trade him to us. The yeah. other thing, too, about this is Wilkes is from Charlotte, right? Is that he was had that he was part of the coaching staff in 2013, 2014, 2015. And then here's the other thing is that at each week that he does better, not only is it what the name would have to be is that Steve Wilkes is part of the lawsuit against the NFL that was started by Brian Flores. Mm. And isn't Flores with the Steelers now? Yeah. He's an assistant yeah, okay. coach and a linebackers coach. Yes, sir. So he's part of essentially this class action lawsuit because of what happened to him with the Cardinals and this kind of systemic issue that's been going. So, Imagine the the dang, the risk you take as the Panthers to be involved with saying, sorry, no go, Wilkes, right? Uh, so I think he's earned it, and I think there's a lot of factors right now that are making it difficult uh, to say uh, we're going to go a different direction. Well, I look at Shaq Thompson's comments, too, to where what's the temperature of the locker room, a respected veteran saying he wants Wilkes around for a while, listen to what the players say. Then the question is, is, well, how much turnover is there going to be with the current roster where it hasn't been up to snuff, but you stand to benefit from what's been the worst division in football this season. So yep. it's, you know, that's that's kind of where you're at. I, I have two other quick questions for both of you, you, you guys. Quarterback in 2023, if I gave you the keys to the Cadillac, who's under center for the Panthers? Week one oh, and then God. really beyond, because oh, maybe you, you re-sign Darnold and you bring along a rookie. That's what I would do, but have at it. Tony is already slumped back in his chair because I'm on team Matt Corral, baby. Uh, listen, I, I, I like this guy coming out of Ole Miss. I think that he's very underrated in terms of his skill set. I think he has a big time arm. I think he's mobile. He has to over questions about his injuries, which I understand, you know, he had injuries final year in college at the end. He had a list Frank at the in preseason this year. Mm -hmm. So people have some concerns. I understand. And, you know, up until a few weeks ago, we were picking in like the top five of the draft. So Panther <laughs> fans have been looking like we've been looking at quarterback prospects coming to the draft, wondering who we're going to pick. A lot of Panther fans seem to think that we would still pick one this year, even if we do go on a run here. Mm -hmm. um, I really like Matt Corral. You know, I, I'm hoping that he gets a shot to prove that he is the guy. I know you can't necessarily give him the thing, but I, I really like Matt Corral. I like his energy. I like the underdog mentality and talent. So, yeah, I, I might be an underdog in this uh, scenario, but I'm, I'm I'm pulling for Matt Corral. You said I got the keys. Is it realistic or uh, pipe? Dream what you would do. What you would do. We give you, you're in charge. What would you do? I would... If I was David Tepper, I'd pull out my $18 billion checkbook and I'd go get Lamar Jackson. <laughs> and I would say, here's $300 million guaranteed. Uh, sit out this year if you got to. No, uh, I think this is that right now, it just depends, I guess, where you're going to fall in the draft. Um, it's true. Even, it's true. If you, uh, if, even if, you know, no, despite whether or not we pick a quarterback, um, we're probably out of the range. We're probably falling out of the range. We're going to get the guy that is probably the most polished from day one that I guess would be Bryce Young that could literally start. I think you, whoever you pick, whether it even, even if it's like Levis or, um, you know, you're picking the litter except for Bryce Young, um, they, you don't want to just rush them in. Like you don't want to force them to start from day one. So I think you're thinking some sort of veteran presence, at least to be on the roster, uh, so you, maybe they could beat them out in training camp or they would go in 
halfway through the season or an injury would come up like Kenny Pick, you know, like kind of the Kenny Pickett thing. They didn't want to mm-hmm. start basically what you guys did with Pickett in a sense. Yep. No matter if you pick the guy in the second or the first, I think that's probably the deal is that um, I guess I like, I mean, you might end up having to give Sam Darnold a one year deal, which kind of stinks. So I'm going to tell you the guy, yeah. this is what I would do. Okay. Uh, Cody Lashley is going to hate this. But I go get Gardner Minshew to be that dude. Minshew magic. Yeah. yeah. Gardner Minshew, former okay. East Bell, barely played for ECU for like four games. Uh, that's uh, I'm in Greenville, North Carolina, bro. So I'm like right down the road from you. Oh, yeah. Cody is disgusted right now. There's no yeah. winkle in his eye right now. He just hates Smoke coming out of his Gardner ears. Min- yeah. Look, is he hates yeah. Gardner Minshew because Gardner Minshew had more success in the same amount of time on the Jacksonville oh, Jaguars go, than dude. Trevor Lawrence did. That's all, all right, all right, all right. Go. I got one more. I got one more. I got one yeah. more. Um, so there were reports earlier this year, Brian Burns, hmm. that the Panthers were offered two first-round draft picks for him. Would you have made that deal if you were David Tepper? I would not have. I think that we made the right decision. You know, we were arguing about Brian Burns recently on the show and about having to, you know, now that you didn't trade him, you have to make him one of, if not the highest paid edge rusher in the NFL, because that's how things go now. And Brian Burns, you know, he has gotten better every single year. And there's always been certain gripes and nitpicks on Brian Burns. You know, he doesn't quite finish. He doesn't quite wrap up. He doesn't take over games like Vaughn Miller, such and such. And to me, it's like a talent like Brian Burns that's, one, 24 years old, continues to get better and better. You don't just come across those types of guys. And you already need a defensive end on the other side of Brian Burns. And now you're going to go get rid of your only defensive line pro bowler. Mm. It just, it really made no, no sense. Uh, and, and he's the type of player that he gets better every single year. And you just imagine that if you added some more pass rush help, like a nasty tandem between him and someone else. Last year, we had that with Hassan Reddick. Uh, Brian Burns and Hassan Reddick were just mm. going off and doing crazy numbers. But this year, he's already got 10 sacks. Uh, so I, I really do think Brian Burns is one of those players that the Panthers are going to build around, uh, especially on defense for the foreseeable future. So the Rams also weren't giving up a pick this year. It would have been next year's mm. first round pick. So it wasn't even like an immediate payoff trade. I, I think the Panthers made the right decision, especially now that we're looking to actually contend for the division yeah i mean you need brian burns right now so yeah. I'm, I'm happy that they didn't deal him away the mistake was not trading uh brian burns the mistake was not extending brian burns before this season where we didn't have to pay where we i mean that's just what i continue to say is look is you can't have a you can't just give a coach next year nothing to work with uh, and if we if without Brian Burns, they're all going to be rookies. They're all going to be unproven or you're just going to go get some free agent. We should have just extended them earlier. Uh, my back question and just kind of round out this show is um, I mean, thank you for being so generous with your time. Of course. Is um, who wins this game? And if it's the Steelers, how do they do it? All right. So if Kenny Pickett does not go right now, we're recording on Wednesday. It's unclear. I don't think Kenny Pickett will play. I could be wrong about that. If he does not play, I think that the Panthers should have more to play for right now. And I'd take the Panthers to win 23 to 17. If Pickett goes, you can pretty much just flip that score and say Steelers will win. So I think a lot is contingent upon that. Probably giving Pickett more of the benefit of the doubt. But I do think that this Steelers offense operates with a little bit more juice with the rookie quarterback under center. But if Pickett does not go, and I don't expect him to, again, we'll see how he progresses through concussion protocol. I've got the Panthers winning 23 to 17 on Sunday. Okay. Okay. Do you think Mason Rudolph? So it, it, it would be, I read a report that it would be Mason Rudolph or that Mason Rudolph would probably be the guy uh, is, I know we kind of touched on this, but do you have any faith of, of Rudolph? <laughs> being, you know, it's like, cause look, we've been there before. We've been, depending yeah. on PJ, we, we've depended on PJ Walker 
And PJ mm-hmm. Walker has shown up for us in some big moments. Like, do you think there's any chance that Mason Rudolph, who does have experience, could possibly make this happen? He has a winning record as a starter. Rudolph gets a bad rap. Now, what Steelers fans think about a lot, too, is last season when Rudolph was filling in for Roethlisberger, who was dealing with COVID for a game. They threw Rudolph, he threw 50 passes in one game, not a recipe for any backup to have success filling in, but he can come in for a game or two and manage the game. You do an adequate job. Look, not every guy is a truck. Quarterbacks are trucks or trailers. You can either haul and it doesn't really matter what you have around him. He's able to carry the load or you need some help around him. And so you know what Mason Rudolph is. He's yeah. definitely a trailer and not a truck, but he gets a bad rap a lot of times just around the league, uh, whether it's due to the brawl or he's just kind of, you know, <laughs> we'll see what happens. I think he's a backup though. He he was never going to be Ben Roethlisberger's heir. Let's not yeah. sugarcoat that, but could he be capable of playing serviceable football and the Steelers win? Sure. Why not? That could definitely happen. I will say this, though, too. Bring this back to the Panthers and the NFC South. This is a Panthers Mm -hmm. podcast. We live in a world where all four teams in the NFC South could finish 6-11 and we'll have absolute chaos. And I hope you'll see it. Oh, that would be crazy. Uh, I, there's uh, no way Kenny Pickett plays this week after what's happened with Devontae Parker and the, the Patriots. Everybody's got to be super cautious in a season where the NFL, just four years after taking the high ground, high road and acting like being overly careful four or five years ago, what it yeah. is, maybe not overly careful, have had two high profile incidents with two attack of Aloha, mm-hmm. now Devontae Parker of mishandling players and concussions and those teams and the NFL are under it. All right, Mark, tell them, uh, the, man, you've been a fantastic guest. You've given us so much insight. I hope Devontae, uh, not Dev- I hope Najee Harris gets 61 yards rushing. <laughs> and uh, also Deontay Foreman gets 61 yards rushing. That will pay off on my prize picks. They sponsor our Tuesday night show. That's just me talking about my bet from last night. And uh, thanks for coming on the show. Can you tell our listeners how they can find your work? Yes, sir. You can look us up on YouTube. That's probably the easiest way. You can just search my name, Mark Bergen Steelers. You can also search Ike Taylor Steelers. And our show will inevitably pop up. We're the Believe in Steelers show. We're out twice a week during the season, recapping games, previewing the week ahead. And my co-host, Ike Taylor, he played for the team for 12 years. We have a lot of fun each week on our show. So, Look, I mean, this is our fourth season. I hope we can make it to 10 like you fellas. And keep plugging, bro. Yes. That's all you got to do. Just keep talking. Yes. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I've, listen, I've flapped my gums enough tonight. But, fellas, thank you, thank you to both of you for having me on tonight. Uh, I had a lot of fun. Thank you so awesome, much. Awesome, man. Me. We appreciate thank it, you, man. Mark. Oh, are you uh, hurricanes or penguins? <laughs> Neither, neither. And oh, okay. to confuse you even more, I grew up in the Chicago suburbs. But oh, listen, so we'll talk about that the guy. next time. All right. Yes, sir. Have a good one. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Larry, Mark. Wow. Uh, fun stuff there. All right. Uh, we held him up. He's like, I got to go. I got to <laughs> no. get the fuck out of here. <laughs> uh, no, it, it was a great interview, though. Great yeah, insights. And I like when the guest has questions for us and wants to pick our brain a little bit, too. That's uh, That's fun. Do you really yeah, believe uh, that about Gardner Minshew? Are you just trying to piss me off? Well, I mean, like, uh, yeah, maybe a little. Like, I mean, what do you I mean? You probably should have somebody. I mean, it's like if you're not going to bring back Sam Darnold, you got to bring in somebody. If you are, I would think this. There's only there. What are the options? The options are, like you said, to roll with Matt Corral. Mm-hmm. But I think you just have to have somebody on the roster that's played some games before. Oh, right. I could just. Yeah, uh, well, no, I like, I mean, a Darnold, uh, a, in, a, in a sense, right. a Trubisky, right. is that, like, you can't just put all your eggs in a completely unknown basket, particularly coming off an injury, even if you really think he's going to win it. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, I just think that would be irresponsible to be like, oh, we're going to rock with Corral and PJ. Like, I mean, that would just be like, a, a, and and it might turn out to be Matt Corral starting in week one, but I just feel like it would be an unnecessary risk. Yeah. Now, what else? The if you go and draft a guy in the top ten, 
what are you going to do? I mean, are you going to, is it truly going to be a competition between him and Corral? Like that would also be insane. In fact, I was mentioning this with Monty from the four man rush today. Yeah. He was talking about how Corral fans potentially are scared. He's talking about me, by the way. Right, right. That's so fine. Stupid. That's fine. But like, no, I don't even think that's a fair, like a, uh, a realistic criticism because if you bring right. in a guy in the first round, yeah, like there's no way in the world you're going to make it a true competition between him and Corral. Yeah, Imagine like him. What pick. would that say about your draft pick? That would be like the year that they draft the, uh, the Redskins drafted RG three and Kirk cousins. And like, what if Kirk cousins played better in camp? And they were like, you know what? Yeah. We're going to go gonna start you over the number yeah. two pick. Like, so I think that's unrealistic. So, if that's an unrealistic um, competition, you have a decision to make if you draft that quarterback that you're going to give him the keys no matter what, and he's going to be starting from day one. Yeah. Or you bring in a third that could potentially say we're going to try to – and then you let the, whatever the kid is try to beat him out. And if not, you say, oh, we're waiting for him to be ready. Like, So I just feel like now – and then this is the question is who the fuck is the guy? Who's the veteran? Yeah. Is that is well, it Darnold? Is it Daniel Jones? And, and don't you have to consider Darnold, especially? Yeah, now, let's say let, 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 let's say we do what, go. What's three, wrong with three, you? If we go, uh, but I'm saying, uh, let's say we go three and one or four and zero with Corral the rest of this year. Like then you you make the case. Well, all right, last year you mean Darnold? Three Darnold, you mean Darnold? Yeah, yeah. Last yeah, year okay. we started with Darnold, but we're three and zero. Oh. This year, now we're two and zero. It's like once you give this guy an offensive line that he can play in rhythm in, he can do enough to win you some football games. And like you mentioned earlier, it, it depends on where you're picking in the draft. So if for some reason the Panthers slip to the late teens, early twenties of picking, well then now if you want a quarterback so bad, you're probably talking about having to trade up to get that quarterback. So I, I think that uh, Sam Darnold is a real answer for us. Yeah. Going I think more so he, than Jimmy G, who is now coming off yeah. of two injuries. Don't like Injury that name. Problem. I'm just trying to think of who a realistic names are. No Gino. Not interested in Gino Smith. No offense. Like, is that, is he's going to come back to, I feel like he's coming back to earth. A lot of these teams that start yeah. off hot, are kind the of defenses figure them out. Yeah, and they're regressing to the I mean, think about the Giants. They started out so strong. You know, is that I guess I I would say, you know, another guy I thought was a potential would be Carr if the Raiders were drafting high and then I don't really love him. Like every time I start yeah. to think he I think he's good and then I watch him play. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, look, he makes some damn good throws, but it, it he seems to be a chronic underachiever. Yeah, like every, yes, every year, yes. every year that they hype him up, oh, this is going to be Derek Carr's year, and then it just never is, you know. No, I just so. don't even know who the real dude even could be, and that's why I actually think Minshew. It's like kind of like Darnold. I mean, I, and that's what makes me think Minshew is like a realistic option because. I think his contract's up this year, so I think he'll be a free agent. He hasn't yeah. played at all, so he didn't get to, like, you know, hurt. Uh, Jalen Hurts didn't uh, stink, and he stepped in and kind of played better than he should have. The uh, Minshew, that raised his price. So I think he'll be cheap. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And, like, uh, and I think also uh, a guy, too, who the Panthers wouldn't feel almost like a – a better version of Trubisky without the money and the kind of uh, the money attached to him, right? Because they kind of feel, I feel like they paid Trubisky a reasonable amount of money on that two year deal. Um, so they're not going to just cut him. And then Trubisky has the pedigree of a first round pick. So Minshew would be cheaper. He wouldn't have the clout of being a former first round pick. He would be better than a Trubisky. But he would also be a guy you would not hesitate to start your Matt Corral or somebody else over. And, you know, 
weirdly enough, for that reason, that's probably why I wouldn't mind it in yeah, that see? scenario. See? Yeah, because it is, to me, you know, as someone who really believes in Matt Corral, it's a shorter bridge to Matt Corral. And by the way, that was part of the reason why I was upset when the Panthers to Baker Mayfield. Yeah, I because I, I felt like that muddied the waters to us seeing Matt Corral as opposed to if we had just done, frankly, what we should have, which was ran with Sam Darnold as the starter and have Matt Corral as the backup and PJ number three. I mean, we can do all the shit that could have with us, but no, I see what you're saying. A cool and, comment uh, right here. Read this comment right here. What blows? Uh, this is Michael's patron saying, shout out, Michael. Says, what blows my mind about Sam is why isn't he just trying to ball out? He's absolutely nothing to lose. This. I'd be that resume if I were him. And I think he is trying to ball out, to be honest. I feel like yeah. he's barely had any reps. Like, he's like, I'm doing the best I can. I haven't turned the ball over yet. Yeah. And each game, he's trying to get more. I mean, God, if he would have just hit DJ and put some air under that pass or yeah, seen that, that pass been... in the beginning, it would have been like, yeah. we would have been like, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. shit. Look at this. And he's running around out there. He hasn't been terrible. Sam Darnold needs a game, though, where he's been, where he's good. He's just got to get over 200 yard pass. If, man, if he goes throws three, uh, 225 against the Steelers and has one touchdown, no interceptions, that would be balling out for him. Yeah, it would. And uh, like I said last night, too, one of the biggest gripes around Sam Darnold is not taking care of the football. You know, and the, the fact that that's, that's what he's doing so well is that, yeah, you have to take baby steps and realize the context that he's in. P.J. Walker was a starter this year before him. Baker Mayfield was a starter before him. And he, he's in and he has played well inside the confines of the offense. And right now, I think that's the only thing that you can hope for, um, that, that he does that. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful that between him and DJ being healthy now and Terrace Marshall Jr. coming into his own, yeah, I, I think Sam has a real, a real shot to show himself to the NFL, uh, these final four weeks of the season and potentially into the postseason. How about that? Um, I just want to, well, I got you on the line. Let's look at this real quick. Is just a couple of NFL headlines. This is interesting right here. NFL commissioner today, Roger Goodell, I don't have any expectations on potential commander's sale. And uh, this is what the story says, um, is that commander's owner Dan Snyder in early in November said that he was exploring selling the team. Uh, Goodell told uh, reporters from the December league meeting, we will continue to work with him on that. But it looks like uh, things may be going quiet on that front, which this is uh, awesome. It's like I'm actually now Team on Snyder, side, Tim Snyder, because like <laughs> I just feel like he could like win. Like he's just like, and this is what you'd be like. You know what? I'm thinking about selling it, and then he just waits for the headlines to die and just never does. <laughs> nah, I'm not gonna do it, dude. <laughs> yeah, you know it's what? Like, I, thought, I told you I was just Street. thinking about. It. I'm not leaving. Yeah. I'm not fucking leaving. Yeah, dude, he's, he's hilarious at this point. Uh, most people are like, dude, do you know how much dirt he probably has on other NFL owners? Uh, oh, you want me to sell my team, motherfucker? Well, now all of a sudden there's leaked emails about, uh, you know, Raiders and shit, apparently selling naked pictures. Or wasn't it Gruden who was like looking at naked pictures? Ah, of no, so what this is, so what now though is, is that like, I think the latest news about it has been that the NFL and the commanders were cut, well, like used Gruden as a, him and that uh, vice president, whoever, God, what's his name? It's going to come to me. And he's like the most hated Bruce, something Bruce, Bruce something that, uh, that he's like the most hated man by Commanders fans. Bruce Allen, I think is his name, um, mm -hmm. was their former GM president or something to this effect. But yeah. that they intentionally leaked the Gruden stuff to like divert attention from like their involvement <laughs> in the shit. So it's just like, wow, 
really a uh, a true kind of a soap opera there. Uh, that's awesome. And I just picked over to um. Ooh, what's this? Is a uh, this is I uh, just picked over to Reddit real quick. Just see what's going on there in the Panthers Reddit. I have not read this at all. So let's see. Oh, uh, so they're asking about the Luke Keekley uh, mm-hmm. potentially joining and Greg Oltz. And I think he's, uh, this was um, Mike Rimmer, Michael Rimmer report. He said, would uh, consider joining the Panthers coaching staff. And Keekley said, I got to figure that out. I'm working with the South Charlotte Patriots right now. I need to see if I could get out of that contract. I have to see if I, that's a vertical move or a lateral move. And Greg Olson <laughs> chimes, Greg Jolson chimes in and says, if anyone targets my defensive coordinator, I'll file file tampering charges. We have a, a Super Bowl to win next year. Look at you, Mr. Tepper. Um, <laughs> Greg Olson, uh, that's pretty fun right there. Yeah, uh, that's very it, cool. You know, is that you know who beat their team? Who? Mel Mayock. He has helped coach a team in that same league, and they beat. Luke Keekley and Olsen's team early in the season. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, shout out Mel. That's cool. That's cool. Um, I think there uh, was well, uh, I wanted to the, share one thing with you too. I know you're not okay. big time into the draft and stuff, but this is making the round Twitter. Uh ESPN's Todd Mitchay says he believes Jaden Jalen Carter, and you've heard you mentioned this name before, the defensive tackle Georgia character issues that may end up affecting his draft stock. The Georgia defensive lineman is currently projected to be a top five pick. And, you know, whenever you hear news like this, you wonder, well, what what are the off-field issues that they're talking about or character issues? Like, what What is that? And number, if you're the Panthers, you know, you have so many fans that want to draft a quarterback. But would you miss up the opportunity to put a Jalen Carter next to a Derrick Brown? And on the same line as Brian Burns for the next foreseeable future, you know, that might be uh, something too good to pass up if that ends up happening to us. And depending on how far he falls, if the Panthers make a legitimate push, you know, maybe he might be one of those players that that falls to us. Ooh, so this will you'll but you'll like this is uh, just to jump real quick back over to Cat Crave, uh, Dean Jones. Mm-hmm put out the story about the Panthers re, um, avoiding uh, the temptation of he's just talking about a mock draft that CBS does. This is brilliant content is like, let's write an article about someone else's mock draft. Yeah. I love perfect. it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like hey, uh Panthers to take miles Murphy defensive yeah. end from Clemson. Tell us about that. Cody. Well, so uh, if you're a Clemson fan, we're, we're kind of divided for the first time in a long time because he opted out of the Orange Bowl. Uh, oh. and Clemson's, yeah, Clemson's getting ready to play the Tennessee Volunteers in the Orange Bowl. And Dabo Sweeney hasn't had many players that have uh, opted for the draft uh, instead of playing in their bowl game. But he, uh, it did happen to him. Uh, I think Miles Murphy is a great player. Uh, I think he does everything well. Just being objective, I don't think he does anything – at like a superstar level, but he is a well-rounded defensive end that I think would definitely make the Panthers better. I wouldn't be mad at it. Uh, and I, I find it funny that the Panthers had their first ever game in Death Valley at Clemson, and we still have yet to draft a Clemson player, man. Like, it drives me up a wall. I just think that, that that's something that needs to change. Um, but you know what doesn't need to change? Michael Davis. Michael Davis never changed, brother. You are certainly the man. With the $35 love bomb, says the mentality of Olsen and that tweet is the definition of what it means to be a Panther. We have a very bright future. See y'all at the bank on Sunday. Shout out to Michael Davis, dude. You're the man. I wonder if uh, uh, Olsen chiming in on this, even though it's just a kind of a joke and in jest and having fun, means that it's actually kind of a serious thing. 
you know, and like what I mean by that is not like he's worried about losing Luke Keekley, but You're like right. is that if this was something that Luke Keekley, a story he truly wanted to kind of like go away yeah. and not be associated with and like if he walked out of there, you know, Greg Olson and him obviously are still in contact. Luke Keekley's part of this broadcasting circular group that's helping with the Panthers. If Luke Keekley walked out of that radio station and said, damn, I wish I would have been a little bit more aloof on that question or handled it a little bit different. I wish I wouldn't have teased fans like that. And he wanted this story to go away. I don't know if Greg Olson would be joking about this. Yeah. No, I see what you're saying. It's almost like the joke makes it more uh it, it maybe it means that they're talking about it amongst themselves and not in a negative way and not yeah, in a negative yeah, way yeah. because if Panther fans hype this up we've been hyping this up I mean it's a story yeah. on every website uh right now we talked about it on the podcast last night they know it's being talked about yeah if Luke Keekley wanted that conversation to go down more than up I don't know if Olsen would have been uh, jesting with him as much, especially his friend. Yeah. The last thing that I got uh, to mention is this. Uh, Eddie Pinheiro named NFC Special Teams Player of the Week. Ah, uh, shit. Um, making all three. So he went three field goals, three extra points uh, in this past <sighs> game. And this kind of, I think CK was the one that raised this question last night. Is what do you do uh, as Pinheiro has been pretty good this year for the Panthers? Aside from maybe the first game he played, I think he missed a kick. He's maybe had one other kerfuffle or two the most. Um, but then you have the guy whose hamstring ex or groin exploded, uh, Zane Gonzalez, yeah. who is prob is under contract. You almost probably have to bring – do you bring back both? Oh. Mm, uh, you know, at least I, for camp. That yeah, sounds expensive, so. though. I mean, they can't, you know what I'm saying? That sounds expensive because you're not you have to go pay Pinera a little bit. I almost don't even mind it due to the bad luck that we've had at the position. You know, from Joey Slide to uh, Santoso. You know, it's like we've had so many different kickers at the position. You know, I, I, it's almost a good problem to have having two kickers that can go and do the job. But um, I don't know. I mean, I know we were all really upset at Eddie Pinero after the Anto loss. And I was too, you know, but I, I think that he's really done well. Uh, that article is, or him winning player of the week, that's a testament to that. I don't know. Right now, I don't really feel too strong one way or, or, or another. Who would you pick if you had to go one or the other? for sure next season i have no idea it's, yeah, I have yeah no I idea. and the reason i say that is because i honestly haven't seen enough of zane gonzalez to have a tremendous yeah. amount of faith in him and now that he's injured like i know people were optimistic about him and he had been answering the call right like i mean he had been yeah. doing enough to warrant him to be the carolina panthers kicker but now you factor in the injury and it's not like all of a sudden it's like oh well he's automatic and you know i was still kind of getting to know him um yeah so i think the fact that you've been hurt and pinero has been playing well um yeah gosh i guess if we just have to look at the contract and see how much money and you have to see how healthy gonzalez is is that, is this going to linger? I mean, you can't have another year where you go into camp and all of a sudden, like in week one, he's hurt. Um, yeah, I mean, and I don't even know how long we have him under contract. I think he for. was on a two-year deal. I can look it up real quick. Yeah, I mean, um, But I we don't had know. just I, extended him, right? Yeah, I want to say so. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, mean, I feel like we just and everybody well. was like, "Oh, we just uh, figured out our our kicking situation." Like everybody was hype. A lot of people were hype on him. Though we he yeah, signed well, a well. four year contract with the Browns. No, this was Browns. Zane Gonzalez was uh he. It what looks like he. 
He was with the Browns. Uh, that he signed a contract. He was with. I think he was drafted by the Browns in 2017. Um, yeah. We have Zane Gonzalez next year through tw- through 2023. If we cut him, um, we save 1.8 million dollars against the cap. Hmm. If we keep him. He counts two point four million dollars against the cap. I mean, maybe this is a audition for Eddie Pinero. Yeah, so it sure seems like it. And same thing with Sam. You know, if you play well down the stretch, especially if we have some big games and you come up in some big time moments, yeah. I mean, I, and if it saves some, how, how about this? I'm not so in love with the idea of Zan Gonzalez that I'm not willing to get cheaper if Eddie Pinero seems to be serviceable and would be able to do it for more money, you know, why, why yeah. not? I mean, you lose 625. It's going to, you're going to basically is this, if you cut Zane, whatever you sign the other kicker for add $625,000 to his contract. Cause that's the dead money for cutting Zane. So like if we sign another kicker to a $2 million deal, it's really 2.6 because yeah. that money is going to be going against the cap next year. But um Jonel I, says Tabor vouches for A2. Yeah. So yeah, um, he's he's got some supporters. And you know what? Is Tabor Look at this. Is you wouldn't um Tabor and Campen have survived the purge. Yeah. The Matt Rule purge. It was almost like um you wonder too is this if like Wilkes um, I think McAdoo survived the purge just because they couldn't do without him right now. You know, it's like, it's just, you don't have anybody else that's like qualified to even do it. I um, think he still could survive the purge. Well, I mean, for the year. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. You know, it's like, but you can't cut, like, it's like, there's a reason. It doesn't matter how good or bad you think McAdoo is. You can't go without McAdoo right now. There's nobody yeah, else right on the now. staff uh-huh. that can do it, physically do yeah. it. The thing, though, is that, look, Wilkes, McAdoo, Tabor, Campen were part of the Matt Rule bring in to continue to try to save my job. Matt Rule's fired. Wilkes is promoted. And there was a there was a target on a couple of people's backs that said, you guys got to get the fuck out of here. And then we lost one game. We lost that Bengals game. And the, anybody else that, like, had Matt Rule's name in their phone they're like, you're out of yeah. here next. And he yeah. looks, walked around and said, show me your phone. Show yeah, me your yeah. phone. And then uh, and then on top of that, did you see that Taren, uh, pot? What was it? Pot look? Not pot look. <laughs> pot roast. The uh, our, um, He used to be Terrence Knighton. He used to play for us. His nickname was Pot Roast. He was a former mm-hmm. player with the Panthers who he was on the coaching staff as an assistant. He joined Matt rule in Nebraska. We lost Matt. We lost pot roast Terrence Knighton, I think his name or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we also lost the strength and conditioning coach, which this was interesting. Did you see the video floating around by Burns and Derek Brown? Uh, The send off video. No, 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 no. You didn't see that? To tear to no to the whatever. strength and kid conditioning coach, and it was like a message uh from Brian Burns and Derek Brown, two Husker fans, hyping up this strength and conditioning coach and talking about how much they meant to him as an individual. And Brian Burns, I mean, it was like a crazy um intimate. Like, I mean, these guys made this specifically for him. Should I look it up? Try and yeah. it up. You haven't seen it. Oh my gosh, it's like really a big deal. I and I'm surprised it. people have not talked about it more. Um let me see if I can Google it. Or the Huskers are I'm trying to find it on on uh where did you see it? I saw it on Twitter. Um is it recent? Yeah, like uh within maybe like um five days ago. Hmm. Let's see. 
It was a and message were... to the Husker fans. Uh, Burns talks to Huskers. Hold on. We're going to find this. Is Yeah, I'm looking too. <laughs> it's, uh, it was Derek Brown and Brian Burns. Uh, Derek Brown and Brian Burns make video out. Yeah, I'm still not There's seeing a, it. Um, one week ago. Let's see if this is it. No, I will say uh, I, I, it, it does make sense because it does seem like Brian Burns, that used to be the critique on him, not having enough play strength at the point of attack. But he's really, really done a lot better uh, these past you know few years at at really putting on muscle and getting stronger and locking out. He's, you know, maybe that's the guy that he uh, owes all of his uh, – all of his games. Again, maybe let's see. Brian Burns, Nebraska. Let's see if this shows up. Nope. Um. And what it it just it, it was like this, and it was very a uh, very intimate video. And what I mean by this is, um, he was saying something to the effect of like, "You are getting a." hell of a coach, a guy that I worked with daily for the last three years. Um, and so these two guys uh, joined uh, Matt Rule's staff. I'm going to have to find it for the Friday free-for-all. I'll find it sometime, but um, that's it. Yeah, that's I can't it. find it either. I saw it not too long ago, which is crazy. It was like really – it was weird. The the thing, the reason that it stuck out so much to me is that it was such a personal video from him and uh and Derek Brown. But there's mm-hmm. like no nobody's made that necessarily for Matt Rule. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know, dude, you're, dude, like, yeah, you're not you're not gonna see one for Matt Rule, dude. Uh Everybody pretty much. But they tried to. I don't know. I feel like some of the the players have been congratulatory. I felt like not congratulatory, but I don't feel like the players have, which is surprising. I feel like the players have been nicer to Matt Rule than Matt Rule has been to the Panthers and Panther fans. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not a good look to throw your coaches under the bus. There's a lot of things that kind of stay in house unless you're an Urban Meyer type, you know, kicking your uh <laughs> your punters or whatever in the back of their leg. Uh hey, did you see this tweet by Darren who has the better or who's the greatest beard of December? Chris Darnold or Sam Darnold or Chris Kringle? And I don't, I don't gotta say Sam Darnold, man. Dude, that's a strong beard. He should be proud of himself, man. That's that's a hell of a beard right there. Um, you know, I'm not yeah, even saying it to be funny. I and it covers up his little mole funny. thing. It covers up his guacamole anymore. thing. <laughs> mole, mole, mole. Um, I had forgotten all about it. But yeah, no, dude, he's he's balling right now. Fear the beard. I'm not even being funny when I do think that, you know, when I said that the beard has uh, given him some confidence, given him some swag, some bravado. Fear the beard, fear the beard, the beard, a man's beard, my chocolate espresso. Oh, wait, I think I found it. Hold on. Oh, you found it? Yes, I did find it. All right, hold on. Throw it up, throw it up. I got it. Make Um, sure you say this is from this. He definitely needs to keep the beard. Right. And I, just, I just want to tell Huskers Nation that y'all have an absolute beast of a man as a, a strength coach. Like, absolutely. Like, this is a guy that's skilled, driven, hardworking, reliable, loyal. Like, it, the list can go on and on, you know. But he really demands the best out of you and pushes you towards your dreams and aspirations. And, you know, I had a lot of one-on-one time with him. So, you know, he just made me better in a lot of a lot of areas of my game. Not only my game, but as a person and also as a leader for my team and my defense. You feel me? So 
I was blessed and I'm grateful for the time I had with him. But now y'all got him. So y'all enjoy him. He's going to do wonderful things for y'all. And peace, love, and spite. Man, what's good, everybody? This is Derek Brown. Just wanted to speak on Corey Campbell. Corey's a consistent guy, man. You're going to get what you get every single day, man. High energy. And he's going to bring it. He's going to make you work. You know, definitely appreciative of the time I had with him. You know, big shout out to Corey, man. Y'all getting a great guy, great coach, and, uh, you know, even better man off the field. Yo. Nice. So, cool, um, cool, man. I hope we don't get demonetized from that beat. We probably will, dude. All right. Um, that's all I got for you, man. Is uh, man, I feel like uh, we were done like an hour ago, and we just wanted to hang out a little longer and talk. Yeah, we just wanted to uh, fucking hang out and talk yeah. fantasy football. Uh, this yeah. is the hey, C3 good, good little stream. Got a bunch yeah. of people in the chat room too, man. On the on the Killing Wednesday it. night, 90, ninety-three people uh, on a Wednesday yeah. night. Don't forget, guys. Uh, Friday we've got the um, Friday free for all, which. Um, I hope it's going to be civil this week after potentially the fallout from last night. And then, oh, we will. Uh, and then, uh, so the Friday free for all, what is, uh, it's for people that haven't heard of this, Cody, um, you know, when you brought this to me, the idea of this a long time ago, I was like, eh, I think it could work, you know? Okay. It's turned into a monster. In a good <laughs> yeah, it really has, man. Dude, and it's a fun time all the way around. Yeah. Uh, it's the the Panther show for Panther fans, by Panther fans. You know, uh, a lot of people, you know, we spend a lot of time, a lot of hours on the C3 Panther podcast, just hanging out and talking. And that's, uh, that, that's a, you know, a lot of people, maybe they don't get the chance to, to hang out and talk about football with people in their everyday life. So you get to do it with us. And every Friday you get to really come on the show and talk about this Panther football team. And we ask questions and go back and forth. And, uh, yeah, we try and keep it civil. Sometimes I got to mute G-Baby and Panther Pickle and get a hold of the chat room. But uh, it's all in good fun, man. Uh, so, yeah, everybody join us every Friday at 7 p.m. Join the Friday free-for-all. And uh, it's a good time, man. Just hang out and talk Panther football. Saturday, we've got the Madden simulations, which have been super fun this year. And Sunday, the post game show, which you can also be a part of by calling in at 252-228-5098. I really want this post game show. Uh, some people are asking me every now and then. Uh, I have a friend uh, that'll say, what do you want for the C3 pay? Like, what's your, where do you see it in five years or something? I'm like, oh God, like, uh, I don't know, more, bigger. You know, I don't even really know, but I think this is, uh, I have started, I've been thinking about it a little bit when I'm trying to not avoid that kind of thought. I want the C3 Panthers podcast post game show, the C3 Panthers post game show to be the one that people turn on leaving the game. That's it. Like yeah. more than the radio. Like I want us to beat radio one day. And who listens instead of listening? And I love WFNZ, so I don't want to like, but like, that's what I would say is like, is like, where is the real growth point? I yeah. think I want the post game show to be the biggest. That's what I want. And you know, we're already there with some people. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're a part of people's uh, everyday Sunday, you know, so we're definitely appreciative of that. Shout out to Dr. Rosen for the four ninety nine. It says much love guys. Can appreciate your Dr. Rosen. And, and then Dan Floyd over there in Manchester says you hit the nail on the head, Cody. No NFL fans. Okay, so this is when, and I'm never disappointed. Cheers, boys. Yeah, man. You I guys. think that if we just can if we just continue to be good friends that love Panther football, that continue to do this because we love Panther football, I don't think we can go wrong. I agree. I actually that's why we, how we've gone right so far. Um Make sure to smash the thumbs up button, subscribe. Check us out on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify. I saw the uh, statistics. iTunes listeners are like eighty-five or not eighty-five percent of the people who download the podcast. So if you're an Android guy or a Spotify person, get on up there and hit download. Make us part of That's your it. life in the car. I know a lot of people listen to it. Uh, take over those iPhone people, um, and thank you, iPhoneers. Um, for downloading the podcast and being part of it, Cody. 
that's all I got, man. Uh, we'll see you Friday, if probably not. I mean, maybe something breaking will happen. I'll be hanging out tomorrow with you. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, as always, you already know what time it is. Keep pounding.